Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome so many of you to this Morgan Hunt webinar on youth mental health during COVID-19. As I've already said, my name is Claire Canary and I'm the director at Morgan Hunt responsible for the technology recruitment business. We planned this event to coincide with both the recent Morgan Hunt rebrand and World Mental Health Day, which was on Saturday just gone. But as we all know, even more than ever, mental health is just as important every other day of the year. The new brand line at Morgan Hunt is inspiring working lives, and we look to fulfill that by adding purpose to everything we do as a recruiter. So we are very proud to continue to champion mental health and well-being. And the focus this morning is on how we can support young people deal with the dramatic upheaval to their education, employment, home, and personal lives right now. So to help us do that, I'm joined by an expert panel, or it might just be one person, we'll see if Jack can join. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to David Beeney. Some of you will know David. He's been on many of our webinars over the past few months. He's the founder of Breaking Silence and recognized as one of the top 100 influencers globally on employee engagement. David is also a qualified counsellor and a trustee for MIND. Morgan Hunt hosted numerous events with David over the past few years, and he has joined us in all our recent webinars around the theme of mental health since March. Now, I'm also hoping, um, technical issues aside, that Jack Parsons will join us at some point. He's the CEO of the Youth Group. Jack is an award-winning young entrepreneur, a government advisor on youth issues, and a global mental health ambassador. Morgan Hunt have recently partnered with the Youth Group and we're pledging both our time and resources to support young people and youth group initiatives. Just a quick explanation on the format this morning before we kick off. Uh, the discussion will take about 40 to 45 minutes, and I'll look to leave about 15 minutes at the end, if I can, for questions from the audience. Um, to ask questions, please post via the Q&A function on Teams, uh, but bear with me. I won't be able to publish all your questions, but I will see them and I will attempt to ask as many as possible. Um, so we'll kick off as I can't see yet if Jack has joined. So if it's OK by you, David, um, if I can, uh, I can ask just in terms of setting the scene. Um, you know, we're all aware right now that pretty much every generation out there is experiencing mental health issues at the moment, given what's going on. Um, but to set the scene with regard to under 25s, what do you think are the key issues affecting young people specifically during COVID-19 that are kind of over and above the normal day-to-day -day issues they may face? I'm obviously being 58 years old now. Um, I'm, I'm not in that generation myself. And um, I'm just so aware that mental health is impacting absolutely every single one of us during this, this pandemic blip. Um, I'm asked very regularly, how would I spot signs that my, um, my, my young son or my, my young daughter is not in a great place? And, and, and how would I possibly open up a conversation with them? Because whatever age you're at, we all can be very, very good at disguising and hiding how we're really feeling. So um, I, to try and keep it simple for everyone listening this morning, you're looking for any change in their normal behaviour whatsoever. Any change in their normal behaviour could be a, a sign that, 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 that they're struggling. 
what I'm going to suggest is that the um, the more difficult um, thing to do is is how to approach them. How do you have that conversation with them? Um, and now, as, as a mental health counsellor, we're trained to notice, not interpret. When you try and um, uh, interpret someone's behaviour, you can be guilty of uh, of judging them um, because it is your own interpretation. And nobody likes to feel judged, particularly um, young, young people. But when you notice it's factual. So um, if you notice that any changes in behaviour in, in any of, uh, of our young people, say to them, look, I really, really, really care about you. Um, I've noticed this. Um, are you OK? I'll give you a, a real example of um, one that my best friend lets me lets me share this story. Um, he came up to me last year and said, I'm, I'm really worried about my son, Paul. And I said, what are you worried about? And he said, um, well, at Christmas time, he was disappearing after meals and he's regularly disappeared after meals since Christmas time. Um, he said uh, and when he was a, a, a young teenager, he went through a phase of tending to eat. So sadly, there's history to do with um, Paul, his eating and his mental health. And he said to me, me and his mum, we, we just don't know what to do. We are really, really, really worried about Paul. And I said, this is what you do. You sit Paul down and you say to Paul, look, Paul, um, me and your mum really, really love you. Um, we noticed recently that um, um, at Christmas time, particularly that you were disappearing after meal times, and you've regularly done that since. Are you OK? And I remember Steve said to me, um, he put his head in his hands and said, do you mean I talked to him? And I said, yeah. Um, you know, if you had a bad leg, you'd say um, if he was walking around the house with a limp, you say if you've got a bad leg. If he was walking around the house holding his belly, you'd say if you've got a bad stomach. But because it's um, mental health, you find it really difficult to talk to somebody. So um, if anyone's worried about any young people at all, just to try and summarise that, you're looking for any change in behaviour whatsoever. Um, and it is OK to notice it and call it out. Say, I've noticed this. Are you OK? Some, some of the classic signs, Claire, in terms of things to look for would be a change in energy. Um, it would be um, uh, someone who's perhaps sleeping all the time or sleeping far more they, than they would do normally. Um, it would be their ability to, to concentrate and, and to stay focused. And, and perhaps they're stopping enjoying the things that they would normally do and starting to uh, become more socially distant from their friends. And um, just one thing quickly, Claire, as you know, I suffer with panic attacks. And seeing Jack Parsons arrive on this webinar this morning has suddenly reduced my anxiety levels. So um, I'll personally say a very good morning to Jack Parsons. Thank you for not leaving me on my own for the next hour. Jack, it's really appreciated. But Claire, going back to that question, um, yeah, this, Call out things you notice and, and ask if people are okay. Thank, thanks, Claire. Great, thank you, David. That makes sense. Um, David, could I ask you just to mute if um, or anybody to mute if we're not talking? Because I think there's a bit of an echo going on. If that's all right, Jack. Great to see you, as David has said. Really delighted. Um, and I, I, I kicked off with with David, but uh, I'd like to go back to that first question um, to you, actually, Jack. And just talk about the fact that, look, what do you think are the extra pressures on young people and under 25s right now during COVID that are kind of over and above the things that they might normally deal with on a day to day basis that are really affecting their mental health right now? Definitely. And hi, everyone. Apologies. I'm going to be Young Digital Leader of the Year and I can't even log on. Apologies, uh, we had a big nightmare. And don't worry, I, I, I'm here, David, so don't worry. Uh, so what, what are the current challenges for, for young people across what's going on with the global pandemic? Well, we did a survey recently and 39% of young people are fearing their future. Why are they fearing their future? Well, we're potentially gonna reach over 1 million unemployment, youth unemployment rate here in the UK. So what can we do there? And and, what, and young people are seeing these figures in the, in the newspaper and saying, oh no, does that mean that I'm gonna be without opportunity? Secondly, everyone's being locked up. Normally we can go out and we can go to the bowling or we can go and mix with friends and we can do everything we can. But we, over the last seven months, we've been, concise to probably a bedroom. A lot of young people live in a bedsit and they're using their ironing board 
as the place of desk to work. So this doesn't do any no good to mental health. This actually makes people feel very lonely. And then you've actually got the financial stresses of young people. Some young people will be leaving college, leaving university, getting their GCSE results and thinking, what's next? Because if the government doesn't know what's going on or how to support, how are we really going to support ourselves? So there's a big, big fear at the moment when it comes to young people. And 57% of young people from our last survey we did said that they've had suicidal ideal come up in their mind in the last 30 days alone. So it's a big, big car crash as we speak. Thank you, Jack. I think that kind of summarises what's going on pretty well. Um, so David, um, I mean, you've touched on the signs, uh, which, you know, we need to be aware and, and to pick up on. Um, I'd like to kind of go back to that and, and say, you know, um, as a young person, it can maybe be a bit of a shock when you when you start experiencing these issues with regard to mental health and stress and, and anxiety and all the things that Jack's mentioned. So, but we know that we all experience, this challenge, experience challenges with our mental health at every point in our life. Um, so how, what's your advice to us to help us normalize those conversations with young people so that they start to become aware that, okay, we're in this situation right now, but um, actually physical and mental health are something that we all need to be conscious of and work on throughout our life, not just now. You, you've heard me say this before, Claire. Um, now this weekend, as we know, was World Mental Health Day on Saturday. And there was so many brilliant initiatives around World Mental Health Day. And for one moment, I'm not knocking um, everything that's achieved in, in a day like that. But you can imagine my frustration, Claire, when um, as part of the official campaign, I kept seeing that one in four of us every year is going to suffer with some degree of poor mental health. And I've still got this very strong view that statistics like one in six or one in four or one in eight fuel stigma. You know, we've got to start thinking about one in one. You know, you've got health, both physical and mental. Jack's got health, both physical and mental. Um, so we've, we've all got mental health. We've all got physical health and we all have have tough days, particularly during a pandemic like this. We've got this perception in the UK, particularly that we've only got poor mental health if we're diagnosed with depression or we're diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. But um, you don't have to be diagnosed with poor mental health to have poor mental health. I never used to be a fan of the word normalise, but we've got to normalise this subject. If um, I think we've got about a thousand people listening to us this morning, I'd suggest that every one of those thousand people in the last six months will have had days when they're struggling to concentrate because they're worried about their partner who's being furloughed. They're worried about their elderly parents they can't get to see who are being shielded. They're, they're worried about this debate about sending kids back to school or, or back to university or they're worried about finances, or, or they're worried about health, or they're worried about stuff going on, you know, if they are still working, or they're worried about a new localised lockdown. Well, everything I've just talked about there is not great mental health. So we've got to get everyone understanding this subject is OK to talk about. I know we, we use that phrase a lot in mental health, but I think we've used it so much, people have forgotten the true meaning of it. But it really is OK not to be OK. Um, I am happier in myself now. Now I'm very open to the world about my battles with panic attacks. These days we inspire people when we share vulnerabilities. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of being on here with Jack Parsons today. He's an inspirational young man because he share his, his vulnerabilities in life and he's achieving great things. Um, so let's normalise this subject. Let's, let's make young people realise it really is OK to talk about it because every single one of us has health, both physical and mental. And let's start to think about mental health in the same way that we think about physical health, because we, we just, for some reason, we get, you know, we talk openly about um, having a personal trainer to look after our mental health. But it's really embarrassing to admit that you go to see a counsellor when you're trying to get your, your health sorted in your head. You know, what's more important, Claire? What, what's going on in your head or your bingo wings? I think you know, don't you, Jack? Um, so let's normalise this subject. Let's make it easier for everyone to talk about it, particularly young people. Thanks, uh, Claire. 
Thanks, David. Yeah, makes makes complete sense. So, Jack, um, children and young people, as we've already said, are are having to adjust to all these dramatic changes. You know, education, employment, employment worries, home life, and their personal life because their freedoms, like all of us, are being curtailed. So, what tactics can you recommend to us to broach mental health if we suspect a young person is really struggling at the moment? Thanks, Claire. I, I think, firstly, David hits a nail right on the head. Why are we having a, a World Mental Health Day? Everyone does Mental Health Day and then tomorrow, Monday's a new day and they forgot about it. So firstly, what can we do to really help young people? We need to open the conversation more and more and more. Yes, we need to make it we need to make it OK to say I've got a therapist or a counsellor. We need to make it OK. Like everyone runs around and says I've got a PT. I'm getting personal training, but they don't say oh, I'm going to my therapist session. So firstly, what do we need to do to help children to normalise this and help them if they do have a if they do have a mental health challenge is we have to let them know that you talking about your mental health is a good thing. It's not a bad thing and, and it's the first step. Secondly, we have to go, anyone who's supporting anyone, whether it's a family member, whether it's a teacher supporting a young person or, or just a stranger in the street, we have to go from having all the answers to all the questions. Because at the end of the day, everyone deals with mental health differently. Some have depression, some have anxiety, some of us as have um, OCD. Mental health is such a fast subject, we can't paint it all with the same brush and especially when we're talking to young people so anyone who's supporting young people firstly we must champion and say well done to the young person for talk wanting to talk about it or, or bringing it up in the first place secondly we must go from having all the answers to all the questions because we have to ask simple questions like how are you I make the mistake by saying, how is your mental health? And I, I don't think we should say that. We should just ask the question, how are you? Because mental health is a part of us all. Uh, for instance, uh, on Sunday, I was opening a box and I cut my arm really deep and I had to call the, pan uh, the, the ambulance came. And the first question they said to me is, did you do it on purpose? Because I'm on the Mental Health Act. And, and it's come up on their records that I've had troubles with my mental health in the past. So that's the first question they asked. And I said, no, I was just trying to open my new mirror. And, 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 and I know what they're trying to do, but that put me on ease. That, that made me feel a bit uh, unease, sorry. That, that made me feel a bit uncomfortable. And oh, what other questions are they gonna ask me? So I, I think it's really important that you ask the right questions and don't make it feel like you're pointing the finger so those are two things. Let's normalise it and let's go from having all the answers to all the questions. Thanks, Claire. Great. Thank you, Jack. Um, so, um, David, um, in terms of tackling these conversations right now, I mean, I've already referred to the fact that, look, let's face it, um, this isn't just a young person's issue. This is across the board. So uh, as we've already all said you know everybody out there has had days and longer times so since March and prior to that let's face it where we're, where we're struggling and, and we're feeling fragile ourselves so can you give us any advice on how we tackle conversations we may be struggling personally with our own mental health but we want to be strong and supportive maybe for that young person or that group of young people that we know um, are, are also struggling um, but we're feeling a bit fragile. How, how do you tackle conversations when you're feeling like that yourself? Well, I think Jack just summed it up brilliantly again by talking about his experience uh, in, in the hospital. And Jack, I think you and I should start a campaign to get the word mental take, taken out of the dictionary. Because all mental is, is the health of your mind. Uh, and we all want healthier minds. And But as we all know, that, that, that word mental has become such a negative word none of us want to associate with. Um, I go on and on and on and on, Claire, about we've got to get better at talking about mental health. But the worst thing you could say to anybody, particularly um, a young person, is I'm worried about your mental health. It's that word, you go into shutdown mode. It's too invasive. Um, two things. Um, firstly, um, I'm a huge fan of the language of numbers. 
ask somebody how they are at a 10 today. And uh, because you're not using that word mental, they're far more likely to tell you the truth. Globally, everyone understands that seven out of 10 is okay. Um, eight or nine is really good. And anything under seven could be better. Um, if you do that on a consistent basis, it works much better because someone might be a three out of 10 today because they've got a hangover or they got a new puppy yesterday and they got no sleep last night. But if you ask people regularly how they are, you'll tend to find people tend to give you the same score. Some people are always a nine out of 10. Some people are always um, a, a, an eight out of 10 and someone else's eight is someone else's seven. I, I had this very conversation with a group of people the other day and that evening I got an email from a mother saying she just had the best conversation she'd had with her 12 year old ever about well-being, all because she asked them how they were feeling out of 10. And for the first time in her life, her child opened up and talked about their well-being because they were using the language of numbers. All of us at times um, struggle to talk about fears, anxieties, worries and so on. But um, if you say to somebody, you know, how are you really feeling today? And uh, they only say three out of 10. Um, you know straight away that there's something really troubling them and you've, you've massively increased your chances of opening up a really good well-being conversation. With very young children, um, if you ask, you know, you hear this on the radio, whenever the radio presenter says to a kid, how are you today? They're always 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10. The day a young child says they're only nine out of 10, it gives you an opportunity for a well-being conversation because you can say, hang on, you're always 10 out of 10. How come you're only a nine today? And they might just tell you because you're using the language of numbers and you're not talking about mental health. Um, the other way to open up well-being conversations with, um, with people um, is to share your own vulnerabilities. Um, share with someone how you're feeling because um, it's okay for you to say to someone, do you know what, I'm only four out of 10 today. And, and then tell them why you're only a four out of 10 because you're feeling really anxious about things. Um, and then by doing that, you're giving other people permission to share how they're feeling, too. So, again, it goes back to, you know, it's OK not to be OK. But um, main, main answer to your question about um, having good well-being conversation. Use the language and numbers. It works. Thanks, Claire. Great. Thank you, David. Um, that makes sense. So, um, Jack, we, we've got a lot of different people on the call today. Some might be employers, some might be working with uh, young people in, in an educational setting, some might be in charities, or indeed some are just parents um, or, or relatives. So um, what advice do you have for employers of those working with young people in, in an education setting to support un under 25s with their mental health at the moment? You know, there's a lot of stuff online and that might feel a bit overwhelming. and and everything's online. So, you know, what else can they do practically um, right now um, to support young people in those settings, do you think? I, I believe when when everyone talks about mental health, it, it's, it definitely feels like it's it's been brought down from the government's buildings and it's a, it's a tick box that we have to do in, in the classroom or, or, it, or in the workplace. And, and how you really get young people to talk about their mental health is providing safe spaces and role models, the leader in the group to actually talk how they're feeling, even if they've got good mental health, to say today I'm feeling good, yesterday I wasn't feeling so great and this is why. So we need to have a leader, we have to have a champion that says, you know what, my mental health is not great, I run this organisation and, and on Saturday it was good, but on Sunday it wasn't. How how was your mental health? So we had to have conversation starters. So start the conversation and do it in such a meaningful and authentic way. It doesn't have to be staged. It doesn't have to be a tick box. It doesn't have to be all oh, fill out this form and sit, how rate, rate your uh, mental health from five to ten or whatever that is. And, and definitely not send people the smiley faces. Uh, and rate your mental health because uh, how I how I see a, a, a smiley face is completely different how someone else sees a smiley face and uh, and I use a lot of the emojis so really actually break it down into a conversation starter but definitely have someone leading it and, and get them to talk about their own experiences that is number one number two is 
bring the expert into the room. If you're opening a conversation in the classroom or uh, in the local authority around mental health, be careful you don't open a can of worms because you may open a can of worms around people's mental health. But if there's one young pe person in there who opens up about their mental health and, and you don't believe that you can support them, that actually helps. That doesn't help that young person. So make sure that you've got the resources and the right people around you to support you if there is someone. What about if someone in the classroom said last night I, I felt I felt like I wanted I didn't want to be here anymore and I had suicidal thoughts. Now that goes into a whole new tricky area and even something I wouldn't be able to deal with uh, with the 20,000 young people we've helped in lockdown with their mental health. We I would have to pause back and say hold on I have to be very careful here on what I say next and how I say it. So make sure that you have the support around you when the situation gets a little too serious when it comes to mental health. So one, have those role models to have big conversation starters. And two, make sure you have the expertise around you in case the situation does get a little bit tricky. And then everything else is just do it with passion. Talk about it every day. Don't make mental health, don't don't stick mental health on a poster and go, oh, look at our mental health policy there. And, and if you've got any issues, go there. Open the conversation around the review. If you've got a young worker working for you, it shouldn't start, OK, you hit five calls today. It should start with, OK, how how is your mental health been across the, the week, the month? And, and that's where it should start because you get a lot of better. And, and then the calls will come. So they are my free tips for anyone who's trying to help you, any employer trying to help youth in, in terms of helping with their mental health challenges or talking about it. Thanks, Claire. Great, thank you, Jack. That makes sense. Um, I'm actually just picking up on a question that that's come through, and it kind of applies to some of the stuff we've said. So it might be a good juncture to ask it. So um, this is a lady asking, um, how can we support young people who maybe live in an environment where showing vulnerabilities is either not recognised or supported? So either you know the young people themselves feel like they've got to put up a facade because they're being given that example maybe by you know the adults around them and also probably everyone in that situation the adults and the young people um just feel um they don't want you know they don't want to criticize or undermine somebody but you know it's not really the norm to have that conversation um who would like to answer that david i think you're on you're speaking but you're on mute <laughs> Um, sorry, yes, I was on mute. Um, yeah, I, I get so frustrated when I hear that within a particular culture or an environment, it's not just the, it's not the done thing to talk about vulnerabilities. Young people don't need to change. The people who run those organisations need to change. They need to realise that brilliant leadership these days is when you can share your vulnerabilities and you can create kinder cultures in a workplace. When you create kinder cultures, it's not fluffy. Um, what, what you're doing is your, your best young people won't leave. Your best young people won't go off with long term work related stress. Your best young people become more engaged. Funny enough, the kinder you become. I'm lucky enough at the moment, Claire, to be doing a lot of work with, with the Royal Navy. Um, and we, we're really working at a senior level to make it safe for every young sailor in this country to feel that they can talk very openly about the challenges with their mental health. Because traditionally in the military, it's not very easy to talk about your mental health. I've been doing lots of work in recent months with education with head teachers, because head teachers are also a group of people that struggle to share vulnerabilities. They still think that being a tough head teacher is what people want to see, and they don't understand some of them that great leadership is to share your vulnerabilities. So young people don't need to change in those environments. The people at the bloody top need to change. And they need to become kinder. And if you want to get the best out of young people, you create a culture where people feel safe to be themselves and don't think they've got to wear a smiley face every day and a mask. Oh, I feel strongly about that one, Claire. Thank you. I can tell that, David. Good to hear it. Good to hear it. And um, here's one a question from the floor for you, actually, Jack, because um, it kind of relates to you and what you do on a day to day basis. Um, and at the moment, this is really key. 
what about the impact of digital poverty? So, you know, it's fine if you're a young person and you can access a load of online resources. Um, we know from working with colleges since lockdown, you know, there were young people who weren't even able to do a lot of their online learning properly because of their their digital poverty or, or challenge to even, you know, have access to some of the devices they need. So, you know, what, what advice have you got around that? That can be challenging right now. So I'm going to get really passionate because this question is something I'm kind of gritting my teeth on. And and the answer is IT poverty is very tough for young people. Um, it's not an equal playing field. And I talk about a inclusive, inclusive growth for all and, and, and a world where everyone can be open and, 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 and enjoy and access the same uh, programs and technology. The truth is, that is a long, that's a lot more longer term to, to try and provide the right quip, equipment in terms of the digital that young people need who don't have access to a computer or the internet. There is, local can, communities can put their hands up and say, we've got access to those computers so young people can access those, di those digital services. But this is where I've called on the government to put more investment to local community, but also for the big boys, Google, Apple, Sorry if anyone's on the call who's from Google, Apple, Amazon and eBay and all the others, I can go on and name them all. They need to step up. They need to give their equipment to local communities so every young person can actually access the digital means they need to get access to these mental health programs, to join webinars like this. But right now, Claire, we don't have a magic wand, but Big, the big boys, as I say, they can make the first start here in, in terms of investing in the local communities. Put the money where your mouth is when it comes to CSR and actually give local schools, local um, authorities access to your software and your equipment so more young people can access these. We, we got rid of you. We got rid of youth centres and, and, and that's an issue. So we need to do something. So we need to rally. That's, that's a whole game in terms of policy and, and the big boys putting their hand in their pocket. A lot of them have made money through lockdown, more than we could ever imagine. So I, I'm on, I, I know I've got a few calls with Amazon soon to step up. So let, that's all I can say is, or, and if it's not the big boys, who are the local companies in your local areas that can donate a computer to a young person? Or, or where can you create a safe space where young people can come? Um, but the environments you do create have to be youthful. Don't you say, oh, you can get a young person go to the library to actually get access to these mental health courses. But then you go, shh, you, we can't do that. It's, it's like putting a, we, we see the signs. I see it all over the internet. Um, we want kids to go out and play, but then we put on council estates, no board games allowed. It doesn't make sense. So, sorry, I'm really passionate, but it needs to be with the government and the big entities to invest. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, that very great answer, Jack, and completely agree with you. You know, as you say, they've all made a lot of money during lockdown, so I'm sure they can step up. So good to hear you're going to put the pressure on. And um, Jack, I know you're going to have to go at about 20 to 11. David's going to hang on the whole time until 12 because uh, you need to get that hands taken care of. So um, another question for you while we still have you. Um, you know, we've already mentioned this under 25s are really impacted more heavily than other age groups at the moment with regard to unemployment and job insecurity. You mentioned it. It's that kind of fear factor, which is just awful in terms of adding to anxiety right now. Um, and there was a YouGov survey in August which found uh, a third of those polled um, had lost their jobs who were under 25 compared to a sixth of the working age adults generally. So they are being adversely affected and, and there's proof of that. And that might get worse, which is um, a challenge. So what are your tips? Um, have, what tips have you got for all of us um, to support them through this um, and help them right now with that? So firstly, we have to understand, Claire, the reasons why young people are so distant when it comes to the, the conversation around mental health. And, and there's three things, really. They don't think it's necessary to talk about it. Two, they don't think that it will actually help by talking about it. 
And three, they don't believe that even if they did talk about it, they would get the support they needed. So what we need to do, we need to dismissify all the clutter and all the access. For instance, about three, three, four weeks ago, it was a Friday night. I was feeling quite lonely. I was overwhelmed. And I thought, what do I do? All my friends were busy. So I called the Samaritans and I thought I'd give them a call. Samaritans didn't answer the call and they didn't answer my call. And so I, I put it up on Twitter and then Twitter came and, and, and random people on Twitter said I had a conversation with me. So firstly, we have to have the mechanisms in place to share with young people in terms of where can they go? It, it's a real confusing navigation uh, for young people. Young people can find the biscuits in the supermarket because it's listed biscuits everywhere. And, and you've, got, you've got roads that you can get to the supermarket uh, down the old biscuits. So we really need to make it really clear and precise to what help is actually there for them. That's what the community can do. Secondly, we must not leave anyone behind. If you haven't had a conversation this week with someone around their mental health, then what are you doing to actually help mental health? I would, my pledge to everyone on here is go and ask whether they're a family member, whether they're a friend, whether they're, they're a new temp that's just joined your business. Ask them how they are and do your part to do men, to, to actually support the mental health movement. And thirdly, we must reassure young people that they're not the only ones going through the challenges. Mental health is not going to get dated. It's up here in our brains and it's going to stay here. It might, we might be able to prevent it in years to come, but it's always going to be here as, as humans. And we just need to let them understand that they're not in the boat on their own. I also think that we need to, the government needs to step up and put and, and actually provide a financial safety net for young people. They need to actually provide a safety net for anyone who's having a mental health challenge. And then secondly, we need to reinforce, we need to reform the Mental Health Act. We need to bring young people around the table and we need to actually get them involved with the design of that reform because actually at the moment it's not fit for purpose. So anyone on this call, if they can't directly help a young person with their mental health, join me and David on our new joint uh, getting rid of the dictionary word mental and, and, and go into town now, which we just created on this uh, webinar to actually break down and get more investment for young people and join us to actually get that conversation out there. I really do believe it's so important. And then thirdly, I would uh, the, the last thing I'd say is I didn't know until Friday that we had a Minister of Mental Health in the UK. Where are they? What are they doing? And I, I've written an email to say, where are you? And uh, and this is the thing is we've got a mental health minister. They're not doing their bit. So this is where the community has to step up. Myself, you, Claire, David, everyone who's listening, the teachers of the world, the doctors, the lawyers, the brothers and sisters, the mums and dads. We all have to step up right now and talk about mental health around the dinner table. Thanks, Claire. Grace, thank you, Jack. Um, so, David, this kind of touches on. I'm, I'm, look, I'm trying to scan the questions and, and listen to the conversation at the same time. But this touches on some questions that people have asked, and, and it's just something that came to me when I was thinking about the topic. Uh, and it also came from that YouGov survey I've, I've mentioned in August, and it found that um, those surveyed under 25 were about three times more likely to report that they're not enjoying their day to day activities, uh, having fun really, as much as they were about two years ago. So, you know, this is difficult. We're all finding this, I think, you know, there isn't as much fun out there. We can't travel, we can't, you know, we can't do anything. We, we can barely see the people we want to see. Um, so how do we support young people in particular to introduce them to a bit more fun and enjoyment in life right now? Um, so what would be your advice on that? As you said, in some ways, it's impacting all of us. Um, <clears throat> what happened back in mid-March of this year was not good for our, our well-being. Um, what I mean by that is that when we went into serious lockdown, we all had to clear out our diaries. We had to take out sort of lads' nights out, girls' nights out, weekends away, big sporting occasions, big birthday parties and so on. And 
one thing that's very good for your mental well-being is having things to look forward to. Um, when you think about it, it's quite logical, I guess, that when you're feeling a bit down, if you're having a tough day at work or you're not working at all and you're just feeling really low, to suddenly think to yourself, in at least this Friday, I'm seeing my best mates. At least in two weeks time, I've got, got a weekend away. So we need to encourage um, young people to give themselves things to look forward to. I know, I know we still live in very uncertain times, but it's really important to do that. Also, as um, speaking as a, as a father, I guess today, we've, um, we've got to find ways of um, sharing and, and replicating experiences if we can. And what I mean by that is that um, with, with my son, a, a big part of our fun together and things we look forward to is going to normally watch our football team play. And obviously at the moment, we can't go and watch our football team because crowds aren't, aren't allowed at, at the moment. So what we decided to do a few weeks ago was that, because um, most matches you can now stream uh, on the internet, whichever team you follow. So I now go to every game with him, but we watch it on the laptop and um, we have a beer before the game and we replicate the experience of going together to football. And suddenly we're both looking forward to going to football again, although it's sitting in front of a laptop and watching it together. So, um, this is a really tough time and, and particularly for young people. And we just need to give them more support and care than we've ever done before. And perhaps to review certain things. I'll say something now that perhaps not, not everyone would agree with from a parent's point of view. Um, but these are tough times. And sometimes parents these days, as we know, we have inheritances and things that we're going to give to our kids when we pass on. Um, perhaps you need to revisit that. I know money's not everything, but it does give you options in life. And perhaps we now need to find ways of giving more support to younger people now and not in years to come. I know not everyone will agree with that, but it's just um, trying to give some thought as to how we can support young people of today. They, they don't want to get 200,000 in 15 years time. They might need five grand now to get them through the next couple of months to enable them to start really living life again. So. Um, Hopefully there's a few things there, Claire, that, that might help some people. Yes, great, David. I mean, I think for all of us having just even pairing it back and having small things to look forward to on a daily basis or, you know, at the end of the week are really important. So trying to find those small um, joyful things is, is good. Um, David, I wanted to just ask you a question because um, when we started talking back in March, um, you had just come out of um, potentially having COVID yourself. Um, so you had to go into a lockdown in, in a bedroom in your house. You couldn't see your family mm -hmm. and they were leaving meals outside your door. So we're hearing about thousands of university students um, currently being impacted on, on campus by COVID outbreaks. Uh, being told to quarantine and put into lockdown and and some of them you know they're not allowed out they are barely given food and support that's kind of a whole other question um but given that you've gone through something similar-ish and not quite in those circumstances what advice would you give to the students going through that because that's really tough particularly if it's your first time away from home and you're dealing with that and how, what advice would you give to the people around them would be their parents or universities who are trying to support them during quarantine i think um without doubt you, you, we need to maintain social interaction um it, it's evidence-based that during the last six months that we all want more communication not less when we're working remotely so i think that it's really important to make sure that if any students are, are locked away um that there's lots and lots of, of good fun social interaction with them and ideally with cameras on i know that we've all got used to this year sort of working on zoom and teams and and and, and so on and initially some people were quite reticent about having their cameras on but when we go to the workplace every day you know we can't have a box over our heads so people can't see us and if we're going to connect properly with people we need to see need to see people's faces so so social interaction is is um very 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 important a lot of employers have, have said to me but how do you really connect and look after your people when you're working remotely um and so this makes me think about about young people again um yes it's never the same as when you're um if you're with people in person i get that 
But there are some benefits about working remotely too. And what I mean by that is we get to see into each other's houses. And so much about opening up really quality, well-being, caring conversations is about having human moments where you get to know each other other than just as an employee, et cetera. So when we're working remotely, we get to see people's partners. We get to see cats and dogs. We get to see children. We get to see lovely pictures on the wall. So when you are talking remotely with people, you know, bring into play the stuff that's behind them. Talk about things that you can see going on because those conversations create lovely, lovely human moments. Relating it back to the, the office world again, um, if I was meeting you at Morgan Hunclair, um, the likelihood is um, you'd ask me if I want a tea or coffee, which would be lovely. You then say to me, did I want milk and sugar? And I'd say, no sugar, thank you, but just milk. Uh, and that's all lovely. But then we'd get into like a formal work conversation. But when we're working um, remotely, you tend to say to people, do you mind me asking where you are in the world today? And you'll say, oh, I'm in Surrey. And then I'll say to you, um, you know, what? You know, who was that person who just appeared behind you? And we start to have more human conversations than we would if we were actually in person. So social interaction and human connection is really, really important to maintain. Equally, if you are locked away, um, you can still do exercise. I know you can't get out to gymnasiums and do certain things you'd normally do, but, but physical exercise is still very important to your mental well-being. So we still can do things like that again. Um, but um, if I if I had a young person in my life trapped away at the moment um, in a localized lockdown, um, I'd almost be wanting to contact them every day, even just for a few minutes and see them on video, have a bit of fun with them and just just maintain that. That's what really kept me going through my three weeks in in isolation earlier this year. Thanks, Claire. Great, thanks, David. So just can keeping the connection going. Um, I'm going to go to uh, try and answer some questions or ask you some of the questions that have come from the floor, David. Now, because um, there are quite a lot, um, and you know, it'd be nice to get through as many of these. So this first one, um, which it kind of ties into the work you do with the employers around well-being. Um, so how do we deal with employees who have cited mental health issues, but do not open up? when we try and have a confidential conversation uh, with them. So what's your advice on that, David? Um, it's, it's, all, it's always difficult um, if you've got someone who um, says they've got mental health challenges, um, but uh, won't, won't want to go for their own sort of professional uh, support. Um, again, I, I think it's about the language we use. Um, firstly, as employers, um, we put ourselves under too much pressure to try and fix people with mental health. Um, it's, it's the same as physical health. We don't try and fix people's physical health. So we shouldn't put ourselves under pressure to fix mental health. Our role as an employer is to create a culture where they feel safe to speak to us. And when they speak to us, ideally we make sure they get professional support, normally through our employee assistance provider, um, or we recommend that they go and see a doctor as well. We don't always have to know the detail of their mental health. Um, that's private. Um, we just need to um, have a degree of trust and try and get him getting the, the, the right sort of um, support if we can. Um, I, I think that's that's very important. I understand from national statistics that under three percent of employees ever call their employee assistance provider. And let's be real, we know why. It's because they don't trust them. Um, they think that some report goes back to the company, but so we've got to get better at making people realise they can trust the EAP. Um, they um, they don't like the idea of talking to a faceless individual at the end of a phone. Um, I get that. So we've got to sit down and, and try and sway them. It's not just about giving them number for EAP. We've got to perhaps um, convince them about that it's going to be OK and, and what happens next if they do that. So. Um, I think as employers, we don't always have to know the detail. We just need to make sure people are getting the right sort of support and help. Um, I'm not an HR expert, so I know there's times when we need to know a little bit more, um, but in most cases we don't. Um, it, it, I think that's my honest view on it. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, David. 
Um, I've had another question from um, somebody who works in, a, in an online charity and they support young people under 25 and they've got lots of multi channels. So um, online platforms for support and, and counselling. Um, but, you know, they are challenged at the moment because it's all gone online. Um, and they feel that, you know, they can't see their clients where they would have had a bit more of a balance previously. Um, so it's they're finding, you know, it more challenging to pick up on on things and also dealing with silence. Um, if it's online, you know, it can be be harder to engage. So I know this is challenging, but, you know, we've all been grappling with them um, engaging online over the past few months, David. So what advice would you have um, for somebody in that situation? Well, speaking uh, as a mental health counsellor, until March of this year, I'd always um, did all of my counselling in person because I felt it, it wouldn't be the same um, doing it um, on, online um, on a video call. But I'll be honest, I've changed my views. Um, I've, I still do, uh, you know, counsel people every week and I don't think that... Um, I don't think it's worse than the experience. There's probably slight downsides that you're not physically in the same room, but I think there's some benefits that people sitting in the um, sitting in the, their own private safe surroundings um, perhaps feel a little bit more safe and prepared to open up and, and really talk to you. Um, it, these are only my very personal views, but and I, I hadn't really thought about it before, but. Um, I, I'm not seeing too much downside to not actually physically seeing people in person. I think you can still have very, very good therapeutic conversations, very private conversations, very trustworthy conversations. And I think again about the language you use to open up people about how they're really feeling um, is, is the key as opposed to necessarily being in the same setting. Now, I'm sure that there's it's bound to be people who don't agree with what I've just said. I'm just giving it from a very personal experience. We all know that, um, you know, back in February this year, many, many employers didn't believe in remote working. They felt people working from home wouldn't work as hard. And yet all the statistics show that people are more engaged and um, people are actually more productive in many, many cases working from home. So lots of people have changed their views about that as well. So um, I, for me, I've, I've certainly changed my views on it. Thanks, Claire. Thank you, David. Um, so my next question is from a further education college. Um, so somebody working in that environment and their question is, you, you know, when a student presents with what they perceive to be poor mental health, but they're showing reluctance to help themselves. But the individual who's dealing with them, they think that their own mental health services um, could help make, you know, get them on the road to to talking about it and, and even help them get through this. Uh, how do you overcome that if you've got resistance from the other party, but you really feel it's the right thing for them to do? What, what's your advice on that, David? You, you can't obviously force them to go for help if, if they don't want to. Um, I know the world of um, mental health counselling is obviously very, very private and confidential. But ideally, and I know it's difficult to get them, you need the equivalent of testimonials. You need ev evidence of uh, anonymized stories of where people in a very similar situation to that person was very reticent about seeking support. But when they did, um, the impact of, of them on, the, on their well-being. And ideally, and you will get some people um, who are, are prepared to do this, you will get some people who, because they so much want to help others, like a Jack Parsons, um, they would be prepared to actually share with that person their experience of seeking help and the good it did them. And, uh, and if, you, if you can find people in your organisation who are prepared to, um, uh, to some degree, open up about the support they've received and the difference it makes, that is huge. You will suddenly get so many more people feeling that it's acceptable to seek support. And ideally, Claire, uh, the more senior that person, the better, because what you're also doing is showing that it doesn't necessarily have a negative impact on your career, because if a senior person has seeked out help for their mental well-being, um, then, um, you know, then it's, it's OK for everyone to do that. So that, that would be my best answer to that question, I think. Thanks, David. And I think that leads back to what 
um, I think Jack referred to it is kind of having leaders coming out and showing their own vulnerability and talking about it um, because, you know, that just tends to make the whole conversation feel a lot more open um, and more honest and more authentic. Um, so I've got a, another question, David. It might be something you've come across, uh, maybe particularly in your in your uh, work as a counsellor, potentially. Um, so this individual um, work works with vulnerable young people and adults um, who go go missing. Um, and one person um, that they safeguard can't access um, some of the services to discuss his mental health. And he appears to be self-medicating uh, with cannabis. So it's a bit of a cycle in terms of behaviour and his mental health and then going missing and, and drug use. So it kind of feels like it's just going in a loop and, and, and where can you go? And particularly at the moment, if, and I've had a lot of this, uh, questions on this stream of people saying, look, we're really struggling to get access to counselling services for young people at the moment because we know the strain um, on the health service, but mental health appears to still be that poor relation um, within the health service. So um, the question really is, can we create a conversation around drug, drug use and mental health for young people? You know, have you come across that and have you got any tactics to assist with it, David? It's a challenging one. You're on mute, David. Sorry, we didn't hear any of that. Sorry, um, generally it's about having honest conversations, whatever the uh, the mental health challenge and whether or not it's drink or drugs. Um, in the workplace, I've always been frustrated about these courses that are for having difficult conversations. The moment you think it's a difficult conversation, it seems to become difficult and we become guard to ourselves. It's about having really honest and open conversations with people. I share everyone's frustration about the lack of resource out there in terms of mental health support and I wish I could change that but this brings me back again and I know this only applies to, to young people who are actually working at the moment but your employee assistance program is your quickest and, and uh, best way to access talking therapy very very quickly um, but too many people don't use them or aren't even aware that, that, that these programs exist so if you are an employee and, and you, you've, you've got a young person we've got to think use the, the EAP provider. Um, a lot of people won't go and see their GP about mental health because they say that they're, they're not very good at dealing with it but we, we can't accept that. You know we've got to get, um, we, we should be going to see our doctor in the same way that we um, with a, a mental health challenge as if we have with a physical health challenge but some people think well you can't go and see a doctor about that you need to see a mental health counsellor but we've got to put GPs under more pressure to refer people. Um, so I haven't got the magic wand for that question uh, or those types of questions, but um, it's uh, ho ho hopefully that helps. Yes, David, I mean, I think that's a, a, a massive subject in itself, so it will be difficult to cover it with, with, with a couple of minutes. Um, look, I just wanted to say the audience have been amazing. The, <laughs> the number of questions coming through and also really fantastic people um, sharing information and tips, um, be that where to get access and help with IT poverty to other organisations that um, you can reach out to. So what we'll endeavour to do is to share as much of that shared information as possible because it's fantastic and if we can help um, with the forum in terms of pushing that out and it, it helps a few of you then that would be great. Um, from my perspective I'd just like to thank you Thank, thank our audience today. We're already at 12 o'clock, almost at 12 o'clock, unfortunately. Um, but I know taking an hour out of your busy day uh, is not always easy, so we do appreciate it. Apologies again if we didn't answer your specific question. Um, but just to be aware, a recording of this webinar, along with the contact details for Jack and David, will be circulated to you all. So you can always reach out and connect with them. Um, if you wish to and, and follow up. And if we can be a conduit to that, feel free uh, to come back to me or, or anyone at Morgan Hunt by, by all means. Um, but most of all, a massive thank you to um, Jack and particularly David, because you held the fort initially at the start when we thought our tech issues were going to interrupt uh, the whole event. Um, but, um, you know, thank you for, for being so honest and, um, and, and responding and, and, and bringing so much energy to the session today. Have a great rest of the day, everybody, and, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.